Hi everyone, before we start the show, we wanted to let you know that there's no Dan Schreiber today, I'm afraid, but in good news, there is our very own QI elf, Ethan Ruperelia, filling in. He is brilliant, he does so much of the stuff behind the scenes on No Such Thing as a Fish. You may well have heard him on Meet the Elf, our special club fish episodes where you get to meet the QI researchers. If you haven't heard those, you only have to join Club Fish in order to do so. So enjoy some of Ethan's work in front of the scenes today. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Hoban. My name is Andrew Hunter-Murray and I'm here with James Harkin, Anna Tajinsky and special guest Ethan Ripperalia. Hi Ethan. Hi Andy. And once again we've gathered around the microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days and in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one and that is Ethan. My fact this week is that in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, archers competed on top of a rubbish heap lovely yeah uh, that's uh, interesting and w- was there a kind of fun whimsical like did they have to aim at a particular can of coke yeah they the had they had them all lined up in a lovely. row they were the targets yeah <laughs> uh no so this is not a typical rubbish heap it's not kind of compost heap in the back garden sort of thing this is a whole artificial island made out of rubbish wow. um so off the coast of tokyo in tokyo bay there's an island called yemenashima um, which translates to dream island and it was created in the 1930s to begin with so around tokyo they were dredging up a lot of the bay to provide channels for ships to come through and accidentally formed a sandy island around the area mm-hmm. um so <laughs> so tokyo saw this and they're like great let's turn this into a new resort but then there were typhoons and financial problems. So they closed it down. And in 1957, Tokyo couldn't really keep up with the amount of waste that they were producing. They couldn't incinerate all of it. So instead, they decided to make an artificial island lasagna sort of thing. So they would alternate layers of construction soil and food waste from households. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Yum. Um, and then nowadays, it is a beautiful place to be. Um, that's... But it stinks of... Uh, old rotting food. <laughs> so not any, not anymore, not anymore. Um, so in the 1950s, um, when they did have this initial load of landfill kind of household waste that came along, they didn't do a very good job of making sure it didn't smell horrendous. Oh. Mm-hmm. There were like loads of flies. There were loads of gases um, that were setting off spontaneous fires in the area. Nice. Um, it sounds like actually, I would say a more fun. Olympics Thunderdome to have. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you're running 400 meters away from the flies. <laughs> or maybe the archery just started as target practice for all the flies that were around the <laughs> Oh, yeah. I did actually see um, an archer online. He's an American guy called Byron Ferguson, who people call the world's greatest archer. This Great is his name. mates. But he is good. And anyway, I watched a video where he shot an aspirin out of the air. Stop it. Yeah, pretty cool. Really? How many attempts did that take? Because <laughs> you always see these box. videos online. Don't you of these people doing amazing tricks and you think that's taken you four weeks to do mm-hmm. that. How hasn't many aspirin it? were in the air? More than you're allowed to buy at a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> he shot an aspirin out of the air. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But then he was the greatest archer in the world. Right. Yeah, yeah. Supposedly the greatest archer in history was a guy called Howard Hill. Uh, this is an American guy. And I now think he might not be the greatest archer in history because his main trick, you know how William Tell shot an apple off someone's head? His son's mm. head. Sun's head, yeah, oh. that was the, the main part. It was the it? emotional jeopardy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this guy, he did do that, like to show off. But he would also sometimes shoot a prune off someone's head. Wow, that's now, more impressive. It is, but if you put an aspirin on someone's head, <laughs> yeah. I think that might be even more impressive. That's really good. Um, you know that thing where the the previous archer in the competition has got a bullseye, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And how do you beat them? You have to split split. the arrow like Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. In 2008, a 74-year-old grandmother and archer, whose name was Tilly Trotter, (laughs) great name, (laughs) incredible name, she split an arrow that was already in the target with another arrow, despite the fact that she was blind. Whoa. So you get get a little bit of assistance with the target, but not genuinely not much. So you 
Um, it's not someone standing next to the target with a bell. Yeah. No, it's not done by cues. I think some of the people who do it are partially sighted, and some, yeah. of the, but some of them are. Uh, not, some blind doctors are not very sighted at all, and she would kind of insist on not getting too much help from her husband. Wow. He wouldn't say left or right when she was aiming. You That's know. amazing. It's th- very very cool. I think if you and I went to archery, yeah. Andy, and I hit a bullseye. And then yeah. you hit my arrow, split it in two, and also got a bullseye. Yeah. I would probably argue that that means I've got two bullseyes now, and so I win the win the game. Well, that's why we never go down the butts. <laughs> 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 the butts. The butts. Yeah, the butts. yeah. What what do down you mean the butts. butts? That's the archery butts. That's a. Uh... Is that the top? That's the training ground for archery, isn't it? The, I didn't know that. Pop down the, the butts. Full of the rubbish heap <laughs> on the butts. I believe the butt is the name for the target. And it's what you're aiming towards yeah. because in Othello he says, "Here is my journey's end. Here is my butt." Lovely, nice. Uh, Lovely. And he's referring nice. to the journey of an arrow. And there are these roads, aren't there? The places that are called things like Butt, like Butt Road, or oh, we did, we covered a road. I can't remember where it is. Uh, Leicestershire, maybe it's called Butt Hole Lane. And, and it's where someone shot an arrow, and it went so far into the butt that it made a hole. Uh, I don't know what the hole is. Uh. But it definitely is like this is the old archery ground and people yeah. get confused and think it's hmm. butthole lane for another reason. We don't need to go into it. Children. Yeah. Children. <laughs> yeah. um, the Robin Hood actually is called the Robin Hood, all one word, that move where you slice an arrow up from behind. And it's not that hard. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see well, you down at the butts later. Yeah. You can test your theory. Right. Okay, probably we can do it, but I've been spending some time on archery forums and it's not unheard of. I think it seems a little bit like getting a hat trick or something. So people will say, oh, I just uh, was down at the butts and I did a Robin Hood. How amazing is that? And people respond saying, oh yeah, Robin Hood. Yeah, nice shooting. Um, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah. And what, one of these guys said, actually a Robin Hood's mostly a hassle because it just breaks your arrow and you have to get a new one so a lot of guys use either pin knocks or uni bushings instead of arrows oh, now a uni bushing a uni bushing a uni bushing yeah, yeah that's right no i didn't bother looking at one of those things but i think we can imagine um actually just on that on breaking things the official laws of archery i was reading them uh, and there's an etiquette section and it says a good archer does not leave litter it says a good archer does not touch anyone else's equipment without permission. And if they break another's arrow through their own carelessness, they must pay for it in cash on the spot. Really? Wow. That's in the official laws of archery. Do they accept contact these yeah. days? <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you heard of Lottie Dodd? No. 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 Lottie Dodd. Uh, she is actually quite brilliant. She was the youngest ever woman to win the Wimbledon singles, oh. 15 years old. Nice. Which is incredible. And then she went went on to win it another four times. And then she was like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to try another sport. She went on to win the British Ladies Golf Championship in 1904, played twice for England's national field hockey team. And then in the 1908 London Olympics, she competed as an archer, won the silver medal alongside her brother who got the gold in the men's. And they became the first brother-sister duo to win medals at the Olympics nice. together. Really? Yeah, That's she's very cool. cool. And then she went on, she worked as uh, a nurse for the Red Cross in World War One, and then passed away at 88 in Bournemouth listening to Wimbledon commentaries on the radio. Did she? Very sweet, yeah. Just cool. going, I could have done that one better. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of Target Panic? It's the... Um, is there a thing called the yips? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Like archery yips. It's basically... Like Dartitis. It's Bowman's yips. Yeah. Or well, um, spinnies in gymnastics, I think is quite a similar yeah. thing. Yeah, because genuinely. Spinnies. spinnies. Simone Biles was like, uh, yeah. in the past Olympics, there was a whole oh, thing about so how funny. she might have the spinnies because she yeah. ended up having to not do a lot of the events that right, she was set right. up for. And Dartitis yeah. is where a darts player wants to throw the dart but can't let it go. Oh. And they fly towards the dart. <laughs> 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 holding on to the dart. No, but that is the thing. No, that's exactly it. So archery is very, very similar. Basically, you either loose the bow as soon as you see the target, you kind of premature fire the arrow. <laughs> or, <laughs> Look, it's, it's, very common. <laughs> it's a very common problem. Um, or you freeze up and you can't release it at all. Well, you, there's no way of saying this without making it sound penis-y. Can we just, um, yeah, and it's basically like it's a curse, and some people get it and they never shoot again. Yeah, and it's oh, really and it's bad. and you know lots of lots of archers get it from time to time and then get over it, and it might be just in the mind, but there is a theory. It's called focal dystonia, which mm. is a condition where you have a right, you have a particular movement you're doing again and again and again, right? Like firing an arrow or yeah. firing a dart, mm-hmm. and the neurons in your brain devoted to that get worn out from overuse. Mm, How weird is that? Bad. Like there are sort of four cells that have been doing all the firing for you, and you use them. For <laughs> I wonder how long it takes for the uh, podcasting neurons to wear down. Oh, oh like how long? Two how years, long have you got two years tops. <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> 
<laughs> um, do you guys know about the Archer's Paradox? Oh, I don't uh, think so. No. Uh, is it the same as Zeno's Paradox? It's the yes. tortoise and the arrow. Not to be confused with Zeno's Archer's Paradox. Uh, so Zeno's Arrow Paradox is that movement is impossible yeah. um, because he says at any one moment that an arrow is travelling, um, it's not moving because it's... It's like if you, if you say we're 10 metres away, then in half the time you'll be five metres away. No, that's a different one. Oh, is it? Yeah. I thought that was Zeno's that's Paradox. That's the Dawson's no, Hair one. That's that, the Dawson's no, that one. is a Zeno's Paradox. That, that's another Zeno's Paradox. He's got a few paradoxes. He didn't have much on. <laughs> <laughs> he spent his time making up these pointless mind How's benefits. it going, Zeno? Yeah, pretty good. I'm uh, working on a really good new paradox. <laughs> but actually, I feel really bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come down to the pub in a minute. Well, I'd love to come to the pub, but movement is impossible. So if you could just bring me a drink, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, guys, what a shame. Zeno's not coming to the pub again <laughs> oh yeah shit what a nightmare anyway um so he, he has the arrow paradox which he uses an arrow to prove that motion is impossible but that's not what the archer's paradox is the archer's paradox is this thing where so imagine you're shooting a bow and arrow if you point it at the target um yeah. then you let go of it right mm -hmm. can you describe how the arrow travels uh, forwards uh, quickly through the air. <laughs> what, like what? Like an arc, maybe. Yeah. Like you have to aim slightly above so that it dips it parabolic. Down. But actually, I've yeah. worded this so badly, it's extraordinary that I write QI <laughs> scripts. Basically, they wobble and they have to wobble and there's nothing to stop them wobbling. Uh -huh. And if you imagine that you've got an arrow and it's against the wood of the bow, the curved wood, mm -hmm. when you release it, as it rubs against the wood as it's going forward, that wood forces it a bit to the left, if you're shooting a right-handed bow and arrow, mm -hmm. forces it a bit to the left, but then that arrow wobbles back round to the right. So it snakes towards Whoa. the target okay. and it's based, it's explicable by um, some physics thank you Professor Brian Cox <laughs> oh. I'm just waiting for my science podcast to really take off um, it's, it's because arrows can bend so because they're not po pointed straight they'll bend right. around so it bends around the bow but whenever an arrow shoots towards the target the only reason it can hit the target is because it wobbles around and snakes like a snake and <laughs> if it didn't wobble around it would just go off on a diagonal every single time Okay. Right. It's not as good as Zeno's. Yeah. Me and Zeno sitting around um, not being invited to the pub. I get it. The <laughs> oldest arrows ever found. Guess how old they are? What, like 5,000 years? Yeah. O older. Older. Like 50,000. That's a crazy increase, Anna. But yeah, it's about 65,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> just stunning. <laughs> They were found. Um, they often, often found in peat bogs. So the oldest ones found in the UK are actually only six thousand years old, give or take. It was found in a peat bog. Uh, I think it's got them called Rotten Bottom. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, guys, do you know um, that the person who was ranked ninth in the Archery World Cup in two thousand and six? And actually went on to live in Japan and broke a bunch of uh, Japanese archery records. I feel like I am going to know this. Yeah, I just yeah. have a hunch that. It's <laughs> done. Yeah. Um, is Erica Eiffel. And who is Erica Eiffel? Descendant of the Gustav Eiffel? No, but related. She was in the news in 2007. She was sort of the first person who brought object sexuality to the headlines she of the mar strong She word. married the Eiffel Tower. She oh. married the Eiffel Tower. Oh. <laughs> wow. wow. Famous for marrying the Eiffel Tower. She had a career as a great archer before that. God, that's brilliant. Um, that's incredible. Apparently she lost all of her sponsors after admitting <laughs> to a relationship with her beau. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, are you saying beau? How are you spelling beau? <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey, everyone. This week's episode of Fish is sponsored by HelloFresh. That's right. HelloFresh is the service which lets you have delicious, balanced, sort of feel-good, adventurous meals almost every day of the week, if you like. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, you've got vegetarian options, you've got calorie smart meals, but also what you get from it is the ability to be a chef if you're not. That's the most amazing thing about it. You can make meals that you've never dreamed about making before because you're given the right proportions, you're given the right cards with all the details of the timings and the amounts you put in. You can't mess it up. Even I cannot mess it up. And I mess <laughs> Even Dan Driver. Up. And you know what he's like. Yes, so, I mean, did you ever dream that you could make a sweet potato, ginger and garlic? garlic tofu stew. No, you didn't. And it was absolutely delicious. I had that last week. I had some yellow Thai style peanut veg noodles this week. It really is such good stuff. 
and you can actually get 60% off your first box, 60%, more than half of your first box and 25% off the next two months boxes if you go to the site hellofresh.co.uk and use the code NEWFISH. That's right. So head to hellofresh.co.uk and if you use the code NEWFISH, you're going to get 60% as Anna points out is more than 50%, 60% off your first box and 25% off the next two months. 25% of course being half of 50%. Okay, on with the show. On with the show. Okay, it's time for our second fact of the show, and that's my fact. My fact this week is that the man who invented the electric blanket also invented a device to electrocute squirrels <laughs> to keep them off his bird feeder. Oh, Very nice. so are we saying he's a good guy from history? Yeah. Oh, you don't like squirrels, do you not? Not much. Oh. <laughs> um, he didn't kill the squirrels. I think it was just a little shock to okay. get them off. He was a one volt shock, yeah. I believe. But you can't, if you can't tell the current, you don't know how you know harsh it's going to be on the body. Ooh, I mean, you Great did point. use the word just because I can feel James getting upset inside. You did use the word <laughs> electrocute. <laughs> yep. You meant electrify. Um, I meant sh zap. <laughs> Briefly zap. Um, so this is a guy called George Crowley, or Crowley, and he's the one who invented, before you all start writing in, the first modern electric blanket. <laughs> there have been a few before that. They've been used before for uh, patients in sanatoriums and things like that, and they were, they were small and, and very expensive and not very good. And George Crowley uh, was alive and working at the time of the Second World War and had worked as an engineer on the idea of electrically heated flying suits for pilots. Mm. Ah, when you say flying suits. Uh, suits that they would be flying in rather yeah. than suits that make you fly. As in, sorry, <laughs> you're like Iron Man. No, so. no, I think his work was secret, but not that secret. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yes. Um, rather than your kind of Biggles style sheepskin leather jacket, he was working on uh, how pilots could stay warm. Because lots of pilots were just open to the air, it turns out, yeah. in early oh, bomber planes. It was so, so, so cold. So they had to wrap up warm. And he worked on making electric suits for them. Amazing. And I think that gave him an idea of how to make an electric blanket. Yeah, they were freezing in the war, weren't they? And you could, it was quite risky because your hands, I think, could get stuck to metal equipment, like frozen to metal equipment, a la Dumb and Dumber. Very embarrassing and quite dangerous <laughs> in the air. But apparently, the pilots would have to get dressed at the last minute so as not to get their clothes wet with sweat because you had to put on very, very warm clothes if you're going up in a plane. But if you put them on too soon, then you're going to sweat loads because you're boiling. And then as soon as you go up in the plane, your sweat all freezes and you've got oh, a coat oh, made of ice. God. Oh, Tough gig. Wow, yeah. Um, I looked into some of uh, Crowley's other inventions. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, right. So that he, he works with general electric so there are a lot of patterns that he kind of puts out as part of his job there was a golf ball painter so if your balls become a bit too dirty um <laughs> stop it you would tip them into a vending machine and then it would blast like a little jet of air to hold it in the air and then spray paint it that's very um, clever just Ho kind of like well, hover painting yeah exactly <laughs> that's pretty cool it's very cool that's very cool that seems um, unnecessary what else how else are you gonna paint the last bit exactly yeah because you, if you're holding it you can hold the ball and the yeah. top and the bottom how are you gonna paint the bit under your fingers that's the achilles yeah. story Instead of Achilles, it's a golf ball. Yeah, it's like the Zeno golf ball paradox. <laughs> yeah. The golf ball is impossible to paint. <laughs> Um, he also did a heater for shaving cream. I guess to, you know, if your shaving cream is just a bit too cold, cream. needs to heat it up. And a ball bouncer, which would be to test and kind of standardise the effectiveness of a ball's bounce after being kept in storage. But then he quickly abandoned the idea because he realised you could just do it as easily by hand. Um, uh, that was like sense. to test tennis balls, right? To make sure that I they all bounce so. evenly. Uh, I think so, yes. That's pretty good. Because it sounds like you'd be a kid just being like, should we go out and bounce the ball? Be like, no, my ball bouncer's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the squirrel electrifier zapper mm. apparently according to his son-in-law david scott he abandoned it when he began to feel bad for the squirrels oh there you go so he had a conscience yeah, yeah. did he feel bad for the birds that were then starving to death when he was a child he invented a device that warned him when his parents were coming into his room Brilliant. Useful in the teenage years. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> Don't come in. I'm electrocuted. 
Oh, dear. Was, he was six years old when he invented that. Yeah. No, he yeah. wasn't. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And then at 12 years old, he set up a light sensor in the, the, the dining room door so that if his mum passed by with like an armful of dirty dishes, it would open for her. He wired up the living room curtains to a light switch so when you'd switch the light on at night, the curtains would close. He basically built like the first smart no home. No like, way. He's like Kevin from um, yeah, Home Alone. Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. I like, really thought... You you meant Kevin from Kevin and Perry Go Large, and only the <laughs> masturbating in your room bit was true. Of that. Another attempt to truly shake off the international listener. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. And when he was um, in his prime at work, he was brought in as a witness in quite a lot of court cases. What it would be is people would have a fire in their bedroom and mm. they'd say that their electric blanket had <sighs> set on fire mm. and he would always come in and say, yeah, it's absolutely impossible that that's happened because his <laughs> improvement was the thermostat. That's oh, okay. Yeah, when yeah, we yeah. say modern blankets, the ones before you couldn't really set them. They just got hotter and hotter and mm. hotter and hotter, <laughs> but his like had a limit. And it would always turn out that someone was smoking in bed. Because <laughs> like, that thing. always used to be the fear. I had an electric blanket when I was a kid at some point. I was desperate for one. Um, I went to stay at my grandma's house who had one. And I was like, well, this is the dream. <laughs> I wanted a Sony PlayStation when I was a kid. But... <laughs> No, but to be fair, the reason I brought this fact to the attention of the table in the first mm -hmm. place is I recently slept in a bed for the first time which had an electric blanket. Uh, a game changer. I got mine for the first time this winter. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. I, I don't know how I've ever lived me. without it. Yeah. But I thought they were very much for a, your granny, basically. Well, they are. But You're it getting turns out they're, very, they're very cool. <laughs> and uh... <laughs> the new PlayStation. <laughs> But there was always the fear of dropping water on it and you'd somehow electrocute yourself. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. um, I think that is very unlikely. But I did, when I was checking if that could happen, I did come across a Sun article where the headline was, you've been using your electric blanket all wrong. Oh, oh, oh yeah, it's shoving up my ass every night. <laughs> <laughs> it's Read the sun. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> um, so um, it's, um, it's always all um, wrong in those headlines, isn't it? It's never you've been slightly misusing it or you've been slightly exactly. misreading yes, it. Yes, there <laughs> might be something what, you've occasionally so what you're meant done. to do? Um, you're meant so, to turn it off when you get into bed so you don't keep cooking yourself overnight. Yep, yeah, you're meant to do that. Everyone knows that. Um, don't fold it. Why would you fold it? It's just on your bed all the time. Uh, so what? that is actually a good point. And that's what I think Crowley actually solved with the thermostat. So the, the mm. thermostat's for tiny things on and off, but also local hotspots because if you fold it or bunch it up, you'd get all these heating filaments getting closer and closer to each other. Oh. So they, they wouldn't spread out the heat uniformly. And so you would get too hot in certain places. Ooh. I know, I hot know. patches, okay. like a hot microwave. Patches, exactly. Um, if you, um, sorry, this question for Ethan, who's a physicist. Oh if God. you um, had these electrical wires mm -hmm. going around you and you folded it around yourself, would you become magnetic? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, Have you seen you know, the X-Men, James? Oh, yeah. Magneto, he originally <laughs> gets his powers after it. He gets tangled up in an electric <laughs> you, you never see what's under that cape of his, do you? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, so you're running a current through it. It's going to be a relatively low current because it'll be high resistivity to give off more heat. But also, it's not straight wires going around in a coil. It's actually like lots of different ones. Mm. So there'll be lots of interference, lots of different magnets magnetic flux cancelling each other out so I don't think you'd be mm. net magnetic sorry James sorry <laughs> what's happened to all my spoons <laughs> <laughs> do you want to hear about an electric blanket owner who did use it all wrong oh god, Please. god. Please. this is um and occasionally, I think that there are risky ones. Like if they're very old, you should be really careful around mm. them and all of that. Like, as in, do be careful around them. But this happened in 2006, which was um, a Burmese python called Houdini living in California. <laughs> Don't <laughs> call your python Houdini. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> call it like point. happily caged. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're always yeah. called Houdini, aren't they? Every yeah. animal that escapes. That's because yeah. you've just stumbled upon the reason why. It's the problem that there's no one super, super famous for not having escaped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the man in the iron mask. Just call your python. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the snake of Monte Cristo. Lots of, lots of... Anyway. You obviously didn't get very far into Monte Cristo, did you? <laughs> <laughs> you remained in prison. It was so boring. It was just in prison for ages, so I gave up. Great. <laughs> um, in 2006, Houdini in California mm -hmm. mistook a queen-size electric blanket for a rabbit he was halfway through eating. <laughs> and so his owner had given him a rabbit, right, mm -hmm. to eat. Right. Okay. And left it in his tank. But then Houdini, for some reason, was able to access the electric blanket too, unplugged it from the wall, in many ways the most impressive bit of the whole procedure, yep. and the rabbit was kind of tangled up in the blanket and I guess was white and fluffy. And Houdini then just ate the entire queen-size oh, wow. electric blanket <laughs> and just sort of kept going. Like he'd started, yeah. you know when you start to eat a long... 
like a bit of mm-hmm. pack troy or mm-hmm. something. You think, mm-hmm. oh, right. I started to finish. Yeah. yeah. So they had to. <laughs> <laughs> so relatable. I think. <laughs> I'm not taking relatable from Mr. Cat <laughs> Evian over here. <laughs> No way. <laughs> um, and the, the good news is, there's a happy ending to the story. Oh, which she is can the, still <laughs> use the electric blanket. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it was used as like a door stopper. <laughs> Traffic squeaker. Yeah. No, vets were able to get it out. It's good news. No, Genuinely, the good. snake made recovery. The vets made an incision and very, very, very slowly removed the entire electric blanket, which must have been yes. a magic trick for the ages as well. <laughs> and she must have gone back to her fellow snake saying, I had this unbelievably hot rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> James, you mentioned getting too hot with electric blankets. Yeah, ago. so I wouldn't have an electric blanket because I like to be cold in bed. I I'm actually agree, and I went off my electric blanket very fast when I realised that. <laughs> um, but uh, you definitely wouldn't have liked this then. So the precursor to Crowley's electric blanket was some less good electric costumes. And in World War One, the French and US military made electric suits, in fact, for pilots. Oh. But they weren't that effective. They'd short out in the middle of a flight, so the pilot would be freezing cold. Hmm. Or sometimes the power came from... Um, uh, windmill that was attached to the outside of the plane. <laughs> That's that was, amazing. That was the Dutch Air Force, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 If Terrible news, <laughs> all the tulips have gone from the wings where we were growing them. <laughs> oh, God. Um, no, they just, uh, they can get quite hot because if your plane went into a dive, probably not the main thing you're worried about if your plane mm. goes into a dive. Hell. The windmill obviously starts going quite a lot faster and your suit gets incredibly hot. That's very yeah, funny. That, that's again, it's that, well, well done Crowley for inventing that thermostat. More plane, dangerous yeah. for the little boy who's being used as a fuel cap <laughs> <laughs> with his finger in the hole. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> don't stereotype. Um, I've been working on something about the tail having holes in it already because it's made of Edam, but it's not <laughs> ready. It's not ready to be rolled out. Okay, it's time for fact number three, and that is Anna. My fact this week is that there's a sea harbour in Uzbekistan that's 150 kilometres from the sea. (laughs) How can it be? Zeno's harbour. (laughs) (laughs) This is the town of Moynak in Uzbekistan, um, technically in the Autonomous Republic of Karakal, Pakistan. And it used to be on the sea. It used to be on the Aral Sea. And the Aral Sea was the world's fourth largest inland sea. So really sort of a lake. And it's now shriveled um, to about 10%, less than 10% of its size. But there is this amazing place. And you might have seen pictures of it, heard of people who've sort of done that disaster tourism thing of going to visit it. Basically, there's a harbour which still has a bunch of the old boats still in it. I think it's got 12 or 13 boats that are all rusted and just lingering there. But it's 150 kilometres to the sea at this point. So they're just marooned. And there's a lighthouse. Yeah. There's a lighthouse. That's very spooky. That's yeah. Bizarre. Haunting place. Yeah. There was, um, when Geographical Magazine went to visit, apparently there's a local joke that if every tourist, journalist and scientist who visits brought a bucket of water with them, the entire Aral Sea would be replenished by now. That's good. <laughs> um, the, so the, the Aral Sea is a very, it's kind of interesting. It is an ecological disaster zone. So it's not very cheery to read about, but it is kind of fascinating. So mm. I didn't really, you hear about the fourth largest lake in the world and you think, well, probably quite big. It was half the size of England. It's yes. so big. Or huh. the size of Scotland, if you don't want to be so Anglo-centric. Ooh. <laughs> or a third of the size of the United Kingdom, top to bottom. Brilliant. Wow. That's um, good. Oh, but nothing for the Welsh in here, I see. <laughs> well, they always so, have the size of Wales, yeah. don't they? They've got the amount of the Amazon being cut down, and they should be happy with that. No, you never see the size of it. But anyway, imagine that. It's big. so big. Yeah. All awesome. water, mm. thriving with fish. And it was just kind of botched, and it was a very quick botch during the 20th century, because it used to be the water was always slightly uh, drained off. There were a couple of rivers that fed it, mm-hmm. and the water was traditionally uh, controlled by the Mirabs. Who were the water masters <laughs> in the area? And they ensured that farms in the area got enough water to irrigate their crops, mm-hmm. uh, but not too much, basically. But then during the Soviet times, because both Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan were part of the Soviet Union and mm-hmm. the Aral Sea kind of straddled both, uh, that was all centralized. And also there was a mega drive to farm cotton in Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm. And cotton is a very, very thirsty crop. 
and it, they diverted the rivers so much that this yeah. entire sea just started receding disastrously. Yeah. Wow. And so, it was so fast, okay. um, wasn't it? So it was 1960, essentially, the Soviets launched their big sort of redirecting the main feeder rivers. And by 1970, then, in fact, that I, I thought this was really interesting because it's a measure of saltiness of water, which I didn't really realise existed. But by 1970, it was officially brackish. Oh, um, so mangroves could live there. Exactly, <laughs> mangroves can live there. Um, I don't think they had time to set up shop. So the freshwater fish started dying, um, but it was officially salt water by 1987, which is another level above. Oh, right. And it became officially, do you know what the last designation of saltiness is in 1996? It's super saline. Oh, that's good. And yeah. uh, uh, much more liked... common word that... Oh, Ooh, really? Salty. Yeah, briny. Oh, briny. Oh, the briny. briny. Didn't realise. <laughs> Brackish saltwater briny. Um, so oh. only nematodes and microbes can survive. But also, oh. awfully, it's split in two, the Aral Sea. So it was the North Aral and the South Aral. And the North Aral levels actually stabilised. The water levels stabilised about 1988. But by then it had got quite salty and saltwater species had started to thrive in it. Huh. And hmm. then it started sort of getting a bit fresher again, replenishing a little bit. So all the saltwater species died out. Oh, no. Oh, no. So, so because one of the problems that they had was basically Moscow kept saying to these stands, OK, you've made this much cotton this year. Next year, you need to make 5% more or 10% oh, more. Yeah. And they went, all right, yeah, fine. And so then they would divert some river. Mm -hmm. And then they say, OK, well, next year we need 10% more. And they keep doing that and they keep doing that and keep doing that. Uh, and in Russia, it's known as the Uzbek Skoya Dila, which is like the Uzbek business, because even once the ROC disappeared they still kept saying well we need another five percent next year and the people would be like yeah fine that'll be all right and they just kept saying that they were creating all this cotton but they weren't making it and so <laughs> they, they sound like me they sound like me at work <laughs> yeah 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 i've got that covered <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly you can imagine and 1983 wow. they claimed that 981,000 tons of cotton were being harvested that were not being harvested <laughs> And then when Brezhnev died and Andropov came in, Andropov decided he wanted to do this sort of big anti-corruption drive. And they picked on... Because the, there was corruption happening everywhere, obviously, mm -hmm. but they picked on this in particular. Uh, and it was so huge that Sharov Rashidov, who had been in charge of Uzbekistan until then, he'd been buried in some huge place in the middle of Tashkent. They exhumed his body oh, and buried no. him in like a normal grave. That's how much of a big deal it was. Right. What, to punish him for the fact that he'd lied about yeah, producing yeah, all yeah. this cotton? Isn't that amazing? Wow. And then um, when in 1991, when Uzbekistan became its own country and Islam Karimov came in, yeah. the first thing he did was just pardon everyone. <laughs> so yeah, anyone really? who'd been in prison about any of this stuff he said oh well it was just the soviets being soviets so it's not your fault and wow yeah, that's that's that was amazing. i mean you know a bit of reconciliation with the past probably a good thing with you coming i know islam karimov was not a great president it depends who you are yeah it's true <laughs> if you're part of the security apparatus <laughs> he's a great guy um yeah so the aral sea just quickly one more thing on that mm. this is a really cool thing about it and it's a reason that you james might want to go there well i do well, you could be, James, the first person on Earth to map the Aral Desert as it now is. You're oh. doing your impression of the watermen again. Yeah, I don't know what that's about. Yeah, yeah. I just sort of like feel uh, very connected to it. Um, no, there is a theory that this is the last land surface on Earth that is not mapped. Oh. Satellites have taken pictures of it from a very long way away, but mm. no one has done on-the-ground cartography oh. because it's new land. Would yeah. I have wow. to train as a cartographer before I do this well, mapping? I should think so. I <laughs> should just do it on a piece of paper. <laughs> I mean, what kind of cartographer do you want to be? Do you want to be a 17th century one where you tell them and say, I'm naming that after my wife and that after my wife? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said I could do it. You could do it. I mean, you could do a very, very amateurish cartography <laughs> job. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that theory that this desert yeah. exists it's so cool. Like yeah. new, new land. It's the um, Aralcum Salt Desert is known as today, uh, mm. and it's 5 million hectares, which is bigger than Denmark. Wow. wow. No so... idea how it is compared to Wales, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's mega. 
Yeah, That's wow. Cool. OS Maps app wouldn't work there, is what you're saying. No, and I don't think those cars. Google cars have quite got to <laughs> the salt flats. <laughs> Your Uber is 17 <laughs> days away. <laughs> oh my God, now he's 18 days away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one more very quick thing about Moynac, which is the town. Um, when they RLC first began to really deplete and the Soviet Union still existed around that time. They weren't uh, on the coast, but they had all these factories that were for canning fish. Mm -hmm. And so what the Soviet Union did is that they would transport fish all the way from the Pacific to Moynak so that the townspeople could still work in the factories canning fish, no. even though they were nowhere near the sea anymore. Wow. Isn't oh that amazing? Oh my God. That's very cool. At some point they must have thought, this is not a very sustainable line of work. I'm sure they did think that. The Mirabs would have thought, sorry, the Mirabs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wow. It's interesting. Um, and the other thing about Aral Sea is that there's an island there, which in Russia is known as Vozrajdenya, which means rebirth. Uh, and it's where it's mentioned in Call of Duty Black Ops, which I believe mm. is a video game. It is. <laughs> Certainly yeah. is, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was also a place where they had a biological weapons research facility and where a big cloud of smallpox was released in 1971. Tremendous. Wow. A happy place. <laughs> yeah. So, All over. Did, did they dump the stuff in the water? Did they dump? They didn't dump it. It just kind of, it, it, there was an explosion, a load of smallpox oh, went, and then it's landed. So when when I'm making my map mm. and say there's Polina Hill and there's Polina <laughs> Valley and stuff, uh, I need to watch out for smallpox because yeah. it might still be there. And the big, big problem about that is now that it's not a lake anymore, animals can just wander to this island, which they never would be able oh. to do before. So it means that if there are any biological things on that island... We're going to um, get mutant animals who can take over the world. We're going to get bears with wings. precisely what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or just sort of... Smallpox deer spreading it. All yeah. that, yeah. 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 That's actually, I thought it was um, quite interesting reading about that chemical weapons testing area because the area where it happened, in fact, the capital of Karakul, Pakistan, which is the region this is in, is called Nukas. Which feels like oh, a very dangerous almost name to give yourself in middle of the Cold War when you've got some uh, oh, military oh. stuff going on, doesn't oh, it? Oh, nuke us. Yeah. I thought you were saying it sounds a bit like Newcastle. That's what I thought. Well. <laughs> I never realised that Newcastle sounds like Newcastle. <laughs> 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 all the Mackhams are going, all the people from Sunderland are going, yeah, well, that's, you know, we've had that in our head for a long time. Yeah, we wish... <laughs> Um, just uh, one more thing about the Aral Sea, which I thought mm. was very interesting. Because yeah. um, I looked in some newspaper archives, sort of for what people had said about it before it got all depressing. Um, and whenever it's mentioned in the 18th, 19th centuries and early 20th century, it is mentioned as a sea which keeps on disappearing. So it was very oh, shallow. Really? And actually, there are all these articles, like there's a traveller's report from 1910 that says it's so shallow that if a strong wind picks up, it blows the sea away as far <laughs> as the eye is. <laughs> Annoying. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what the fish do? I guess they get blown away. I'm sorry, kids. We've come to the beach, but it was a bit windy and the sea's blown away. <laughs> what can you do? That's amazing. Go home. Oh, wow. So funny. Yeah, That's and they kept cool. saying there was an 1890 newspaper article about it saying it's undergoing a process of desiccation that makes it seem like it's going to disappear altogether. How interesting. Oh, so it? maybe because it was very shallow, it was susceptible to that. It was clearly, mm. and it had happened entirely, almost entirely, I think, in the 14th century there are documents which show it basically fully dried up Gosh, wow. and they're still finding as it dries up it recedes and it reveals old sites of medieval settlements no, that that's before. really cool yeah oh, so Gosh. maybe 600 years from now it'll be back Fingers crossed. Maybe. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Unless we think it was a Soviet or Russian problem, uh, the Great Salt Lake in America has lost 73% of its water and wow. is unable to sustain a lot of wildlife because local people are using so much of the water around there. Oh. And the Colorado River, which used to reach the Gulf, doesn't reach the Gulf anymore. It just dries off and it hasn't done since 1988. What? Really? Uh, yeah. A river just sort of ends? Yeah, it just dries. So oh. it's like it becomes a river, becomes a river, becomes a river. People in like California, they're using the water so much take a little bit. Gosh, that it just dries yeah. up. That's so awful. You know, it's a problem all around the world. Well, really, yeah. Terrible. So I was kind of looking at other landlocked countries that kind of had a very uh, strong kind of association with the seed, despite uh -huh. you know mm -hmm. obviously not being next to it. Um, and 
I read into Bolivia, um, which is landlocked, and they're so obsessed with the sea. So it goes back to the War of the Pacific, which was in like 1879, 1884. Bolivia and Peru were up against Chile, and Chile ended up winning and annexed about 149 miles of the coastline and stopped Bolivia being able to access it. Um, and That's a real dickhead bit to annex. I know, I know. And Bolivia just haven't forgotten about it 140 <laughs> years later. So they made a peace treaty in 1904, which granted Bolivia access to the Pacific Ocean. Um, okay. But it meant that they still had to go through lots of checks and it was still, you know, subject to loads of fair duties. What are the duties. checks doing there? <laughs> they, they they put in a, an official plea with the hague in 2013 but it was rejected that they didn't have to do anything um but the, the kind of culture that sprung up around it is really funny so on the 23rd of march every year bolivia celebrates the national day of the sea and that date was chosen because it's the day that one of bolivia's kind of iconic war heroes from the time um, eduardo abaroa was shot down by chile and his reported dying words were, Surrender? Your grandmother should surrender, you fuck. Um, <laughs> wow. Is, but yeah, they have a navy um, as well. They've got 500 troops in their navy. They have like um, Titicaca, don't exactly. they? Exactly. So is that where they do it? They do, they do a lot of their training around there. They put, you know, patrol the area. They huh. also patrol the Amazonian rivers that they that are in Bolivia. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. And that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And the official motto is, the sea is ours by right. To take it back is our duty. Wow. Um, and... Well, they, let, I mean, let it go. I know. No, 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 no. Get it back. Get it back. <laughs> All right, Elsa. <laughs> <laughs> Cling desperately on. That's my version of the song. I was yeah. reading. Um, what was I reading? I was reading an article about the remeasuring the Amazon because hmm. uh, they want to prove that the Amazon's longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to travel from the new source that they found, which is in Peru, and they're going to travel down. Because you were saying about like the Navy are, are there. Do you know mm -hmm. what is the most dangerous animal that they might meet? Is it man? <laughs> it is. How oh, is it? Man. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it the, like the remote communities or maybe the indigenous people that haven't been? You know what? There's some of that, but actually it's loggers. Loggers, yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I was so primed to like the guys who are doing logging in the Amazon rainforest, but now you've said that they're <laughs> harmful. I like them even less. Yeah. Um, th there's a bit of good news on land lockery. Mm -hmm. So half a dozen landlocked countries in Africa are going to get their own coastline before long. Oh, nice. This is really interesting. So Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, the DRC, Malawi, and Zambia, between five and ten million years from now, as the <laughs> as the Somalian Nubian tectonic plates move apart That's from the Arabian so plate, uh -huh. cracks keep appearing. In Ethiopia in 2005, a big crack just appeared in the desert. Uh, <laughs> Terrifying. Um, so I was reading an article about this on Quartz. I just want to read you the last sentences. Um, this also means, like, as well as getting seaside, great news, these countries can finally be directly connected to subsea internet cables. If that technology will not have been bypassed by them, <laughs> assuming that millions of years down the line, nation states will still exist in the form that they do now. <laughs> so, um, actually, just on the internet, um, in Uzbekistan, um, there, so there's uh, a lot of issues in the modern day um, with corruption and cheating in exams. You've got about 400,000 students each year competing for about 50,000 university places. Mm. And so they have loads of different kind of ways of cheating to try and, you know, get them into uni. So they bribe invigilators to turn blind eye to phone use and people use the parachute technique where they, they, oh, they can just... I, can I have a guess? Go on, go on, yeah. Parachutes are very tightly folded, aren't they? Oh, yeah. They're very tightly folded. Yeah, yeah. So have you folded up? <laughs> and you pull a card <laughs> <laughs> and a huge bit of cloth with all the answers comes out. Yeah, you've sort of written incredibly tiny writing on a very tightly folded bit of silk. Um, I love that. It's not, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, it's basically they just chuck it out the window to somebody below. Um, who then just Wait, corrects what, what, the, what? The, the exam paper out the window uh, <laughs> oh, to, correct, on, to correct the answer and they just brilliant. chuck it back up. Um, no, uh, sorry, what? Yeah, yeah. How did they chuck um, it back up? So hang on, you're in the... You're doing your exam. Yeah. You have to find a way of going, oh, no. <laughs> and it flies out of the window. And then yeah. you also have to find a way of unfolding the paper aeroplane <laughs> in a way yeah. that no one yeah, notices. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, now the telecoms companies, the three major kind of network providers, all very conveniently have technical difficulties that oh, they yeah. need to solve for like this five hour period where everybody's <sighs> taking exams. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just mad. Oh, another way that people That's would do, brilliant. they would hide notes in, I quote, Renaissance style hairstyles. So they <laughs> just kind of crib sheet brilliant. stuffed in there. If you have a big enough rough, you can just write the answers there on your go. rough and spin it round to whatever bit of the <laughs> curriculum they ask about. There we go. Very nice. Very nice. Um, James, did you ever see those landlocked, I'm asking James specifically, the landlocked population of sharks in Australia? 
Oh, no, I haven't seen... Are they on a golf course? They're on a golf course. Yeah, I am aware uh, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they washed in in the 90s. That's right. And for years, they were like the Nessie of this golf course. Because <laughs> there was a big lake on the golf course. It's called the Carbrook Golf Club in Queensland. How did they wash in? <laughs> well, Sorry. exactly. The, the area floods every now and again. It's oh, prone to flooding. Right. So every several years, they might have a really big flood, which sort of connects the sea to the... Oh, my God. And bull sharks are very good at living in water of mixed salinity. So mm. they Brackish, can like you said. Brackish. <laughs> Not they're, brainy. They're at home in the brack. They have special, fun fact, rectal glands, which allow them to excrete salt. So they can survive huh. in saltier water or they can survive in less salty water. Do they do it as like table salt or like mold and flakes? <laughs> so, <laughs> <really salt>? No. <laughs> That's the third pot on the table, isn't it? Shark <laughs> anus salt. Um, <laughs> it's a It'll catch on. Yeah, and so they, someone someone went there, a golfer named Scott Wagstaff said, I'm going to prove that this Aussie Nessie is down here. Mm. And he went down there with a camera and some meat and uh, <laughs> he got him. He got him on film. And oh, wow. yeah, they haven't been seen since 2015 and the, the area did flood again in 2013. So it's possible they washed out that's mm. interesting I, I once went to a restaurant where there was sharks well it was where was it it was I think dr it was in, evil's secret lab. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that i think it was in mauritius and you were beyond tables and the tables were floating uh on what? the sea were sharks swimming around yeah 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 what? And then the... Uh, <laughs> Do they have signs like, Do not feed the sharks under the table like a dog? Yeah, yeah, you weren't allowed to feed them. But the uh, the waiters would come round, they would bring some meat, and they would throw little bits of meat into the oh, water God. next to you, and then the sharks would come up and snap, 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 snap. What? And then God. you'd eat the rest of your meal. That's an incredible restaurant to go to. Isn't it? So if you were the, rest, if you were the waiter and yeah. someone really annoyed you, could you accidentally spill a tray of meat on them so they'd be devoured <laughs> by the shark? The shark would have to be able to jump out. It would have to be like one of those Mako sharks that can jump out of the water, but I don't think they were those. So, But aren't you... Yeah. Sorry, you're sitting with your waists... There's water. No, no, you're on an island. <laughs> you're waist deep. Oh, you're on an island. Sorry, no, 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 no. <laughs> right, what well, I got is that you're floating. You're, you're on a floating island where I, your table is. The table right, must okay. have a platform underneath it, right? It was yeah, you know the like tables a, are floating. So you're not saying that you're waist deep in water and there are sharks swimming around because that's what <laughs> I am that's again. That's, that's what I was guessing. I, I mean, you, never, you wouldn't go twice, would you? <laughs> <laughs> You're no. very cold and you're very tense. <laughs> Other than that, huge was, tip. Was the food good? Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Did it cost an arm and a leg? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that wombat burrows can be explored by a special robot called a wombot. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so good. So, so, why are we exploring wombat burrows? Yes. It feels like it's none of our business. Well, mm -hmm. you might want to learn stuff about wombats. None of my business. <laughs> <laughs> With that, the, the, the spirit of the Enlightenment died forever. <laughs> um, does it look. Is it a fake wombat? Would a wombat be able to know that it was a wombat? Mm. Um, it, no, it doesn't look like a wombat. Okay. It looks okay. like a small black box with tank wheels. Okay. Or caterpillar nice. traps. Oh, like tra yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this was something I read on the Improbable website run by our friends at the Ig Nobel Prizes. Uh, and it was made by Scott Carver and Robert Ross. And I I think um, uh, an honours student called Elizabeth Brown as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, but this was at the University of Tasmania. And this is a really interesting thing, right? So um, I've written to uh, Dr. Carver and he's given me lots of information. And this is incredible. So wombat burrows are really difficult to get in because they're mm -hmm. quite small. They're the size of a wombat. Wombat's right. quite big. I've, I've seen a wombat big. in the zoo. They're yeah. pretty big. They're big, but they're smaller than you for instance. Yeah. Okay. It'd be tough for you to get in. Yeah, yeah. But it would be possible for, say, a 13 or 14 year old boy to uh -huh. get in. <laughs> okay. And until, <laughs> until Scott Carver and Rob Ross and Elizabeth Brown and their friends made this machine, the only information we had about Wombat Burrows was from a schoolboy called Peter Nicholson, uh -huh. who in the oh. 1960s <laughs> with a torch and a spade, <laughs> went into wombat burrows and made observations of the wombats that he encountered. It's no. so good. It's and so good. Literally, yeah. 
he he wrote up his account in the school magazine mm-hmm. and until the last few years this was the best information we had about Wombat Burrows. I'm so, so jealous. He's so cool. That's the fan that's a childhood fantasy. Yeah. You crawl into a badger set and you find them all drinking tea <laughs> underground. <laughs> I, I so I read um there was a documentary by ABC, so the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Um and they kind of interviewed Peter Nicholson. So he was at Timbertop boarding school in Victoria and he and a friend stumbled upon the burrows. He was, I think, nine stone and six feet tall. So he was, you know, skinny enough that he could shuffle down. He was chased out by a female wombat at the time, a but wild dog. forwards or backwards? Like, I, th- I think you... he'd probably end up shuffling backwards and out sort of, well, you know, exactly. That's scary. Yeah, if, yeah, you yeah. Can't, if you have to... Also, and if they tilt down, they you'll do. have to mm. climb... Backwards yeah, and upwards. Yeah, yeah. I've, oh, God, you've taken me right back to a very upsetting experience I had in an underground car park in Slovenia where I had to <laughs> reverse out. <laughs> oh, my God. Andy, enough about your travel anecdotes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> All you're ever talking about. Oh, it was the first time I'd driven for years, and mm-hmm. it was right down, like, very steep ramp down yeah. to the barrier, which ah. was then closed for whatever we, oh, for whatever no. reason. And I had completely forgotten how to do a reverse hill start. <laughs> and... <laughs> It, that was the most stressful 20 minutes of the, that year. It was horrible. And there were sharks <laughs> swimming out <underneath. laughs> <laughs> But there was no aggrieved female wombat no, outside no. the barrier, well, which I, would have made it worse. <laughs> they weren't all, like, horrible wombats, though. He did become friends with one wombat in particular. So when he, he would go <laughs> down on, there, this is, this and he would, he would go, no, genuinely, he would go down, and he would just sit with the wombat for a while. Sometimes if the wombat would grunt, he'd grunt back just to try and, you know, kind of replicate what he was doing. The wombat would come over and sniff him and put a paw on him, uh, even followed him out on a cloudy day because they're normally nocturnal, so they would stay inside during the day. But he came out on one day oh. and they just sat together outside, him and this friendly wombat. It's incredible. That is a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. It's, that, it's a kid's book in the making. Unbelievable. It. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, now we can do it with robots. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so kids, get out of the burrows. And the wombat is fitted with lasers and uh, <laughs> it can eliminate any wombat it comes across. Yeah, yeah. Well, they have to, like, for instance, because of your problem, Andy, they have to have like cameras on the front and the back because so often you have to reverse and you can't turn round. Mm. Um, so that's one problem that they had. Yeah. They tied a rope to it just in case they got completely <laughs> stuck and they could just drag it out. Nice. So that's kind of a lo-fi way of dealing with it. Uh, and they found something really important, which is wombats have been getting this parasite. It's like a scabies kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and it's been very, very bad for the wombat. And they found, thanks to their wombat, that mites uh, can survive much longer inside the burrows, uh, which people didn't realize before. People thought the mites would just die. Mm. But now we know that if your wombat leaves a burrow and then another wombat goes in, which happens quite often, that's a way that this uh, disease can spread from one wombat to another wombat. That's interesting. And that's something we didn't know before. That's very cool. Um, James, just quickly, that vision of the wombat with a rope tied around it is kind of like an Australian version of the Theseus and the Minotaur myth, isn't it? That's exactly what Weirdly yeah, when yeah. you oh, said that. One of my favourite facts about Theseus and the Manitor, so a ball of string was called a C L E W, a clue, and essentially that's where our modern word for clue comes from. Really? You're following a clue backwards out Amazing. of a maze. So it's it's a lead it? essentially. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. Um but I also know something about wombats, and that is that they are fluorescent <laughs> under UV light, but so are scabies. Oh. Um however the wombats glow blue but scabies glow green. So if you were to shine a black light at a wombat, you could tell if it's got scabies, if it's got little kind of green flecks coming through. Question. Yeah. If there is a bit of a scabies outbreak in the UK at the moment, Mm -hmm. apparently, uh, and if I went to a nightclub, as I haven't done for Uh 10 years, (laughs) but if I was to go to a nightclub, would I be able to know that someone talking to me had scabies because they would glow there would be like little mm-hmm. green kind of areas where they are on the okay. skin. If you people get up are... close and take their clothes off, which often people do yeah, yeah. in nightclubs anyway. Well, people are scantily <laughs> clad, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Easy. Okay, that's public service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, thank you to Dr. Carver for sending me all this information. If you want to learn more, then you can go to his Twitter, which is at Scott underscore S underscore Carver. Uh, and the last question I asked him was... Do you know that there's a US zoo which claims to have had the world's oldest wombat and it was called Carver? Huh. Lovely. Isn't that amazing? I did, thought Did you know that? I said, I just thought you'd be interested in that coincidence. And he said, Cool fact. 
Um, <laughs> that wombat is a southern hairy nosed wombat, whereas our work has been with bare nosed wombats. <laughs> you <laughs> must the... have felt so stupid <laughs> when he's like, oh, an idiot. yeah. Oh my God. What and apparently, man. to the best of his knowledge, the oldest bare nosed wombat in <laughs> captivity is in Japan and is called Wayne. So that <laughs> put me in my place. Yeah. yeah. Here's, a, here's a riddle oh, yeah, for okay. you all. Mm-hmm. What animal is the biggest user of a wombat burrow? Wombat. Yes! <laughs> Thank goodness someone's fallen into my <laughs> cunningly laid trap. Australian teenage boys. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so something else uses wombat burrows. Is yeah. it going to be something of a similar size to a wombat? Sounds you... like it's going to be bigger, doesn't it? Is it? Oh, hold on. No, you said, no, no, sorry. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it does have it. <laughs> I've misunderstood the question. <laughs> it was ambiguously worded, and I thought you meant biggest in size. Oh. You know, like maybe a wallaby sneaks in there. She's got it. She's, I don't how know how you've done it. The okay. most frequent user of Wombat Burrows is... Uh, to the... be fair, Anna, I did notice you throw a piece of paper out of the window just before... <laughs> <I got it. laughs> um, the black-footed rock wallaby. But wombats will tolerate other animals in their burrows if there's something like a fire going on above ground. There was yeah. a story that went kind of viral that the wombats were rounding up other animals. And... Rounding them up and then sort of assassinating them in the burrows. Or no, no, protecting them from the wildfires. Oh, right, um, yeah. sorry. I, right. And they're amazing thermal buffers. You know, it can be incredibly hot yeah. above ground yeah. even if there's not a fire yeah, it's just yeah. obviously it's very very hot yeah. underground level temperatures good That's to know yeah. look yeah. out for a wombat burrow yeah. <laughs> last resort good um, just on robots that mimic animals hmm. oh yeah biomimicry biomimicry Ooh. um apparently we are soon going to have zoos full of robots instead of animals this is huh? the, the great suggestion um, and they've started making robots that look exactly like certain animals so that when you go to a zoo, rather than keeping, I don't know, a panda captive or a cheetah or something, you just look at a robot. And they've actually, they've got Del the Dolphin was one that I discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Del Boy. Also a Rodney the Dolphin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Del the Dolphin is designed by a, one of the creative directors at Disney, in fact, who is now um, working on this and the person who made Free Willy we talked about recently um, they're more cost effective because obviously you don't have to feed them mm, yeah. but then you can't really do feeding time which is part of the fun of the zoo I suppose I um, guess well unless you're feeding them a robot fish and that would probably be fine <laughs> yeah although then that's sort of been cost effective I suppose when you've got to generate a <laughs> hundred <laughs> robot fish every day <laughs> but yeah apparently yeah. rather than having animals we'll just have robots I think that sounds great yeah. yeah there is a temple in India which has replaced its elephant with a robo elephant oh yeah really? and that's again on grounds of animal stress levels yeah. lots of temples in India have live elephants uh-huh. yeah. so the uh, Irinja Dapali Sri Krishna temple now has an 11 foot tall Robo Nelly cool. which is good I don't know That's what it cool. I don't know what it can do I don't yeah. know if it can uh. Amusingly, Hoover up a peanut. Uh, <laughs> it's just attach a Roomba to its trunk. <laughs> yeah. Here's one more thing. In America, they have a problem with poaching. Some places. Mm. And one way that they deal with it is they put lures out to the poachers. But you don't really want to lure with a real animal, so they started doing it with robots. And the idea is you would get a robotic, say, bear, mm, and yeah. the poacher would shoot it. And then as soon as they did it, you could arrest them for shooting bears. Brilliant. Uh, even though they didn't technically shoot a real bear, mm-hmm. the intention was there. Mm-hmm. The problem is that poachers kind of get used to it and so you have to make them more and more and more realistic each time so that they think it's real. And so the latest thing they've done, uh, this guy in America called Volslegel, uh, who makes these props, has invented a deer which picks up its tail and poos out brown M&Ms. <laughs> 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 so the poachers sit there thinking... That animal hasn't pooed for a while. I think it might be a robot. <laughs> and then the M and M's come out and they go, ha, got it. and they shoot it. Uh, and apparently, this guy of Volslegel, uh, who made it, has three kids, and they get to eat all of the other coloured M and M's. Brilliant! Oh. He buys wow. Brilliant! 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 So that's cool. And that's why Van Halen wanted to have no brown M and M's. They knew they were needed for the robo. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we've said, we can all be found on our online accounts. I'm at Andrew Hunter M. James? Uh, I'm on TikTok. 
at no such thing as James Harkin, but I haven't ticked any talks. Okay, so look out for that. <laughs> I try to do a new one each time, but I'm kind of running. You're running short. <laughs> Ethan, uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Ethan Ruperelli. Yeah. Uh, and Anna. Uh, you can get in touch with us as a group by emailing podcast at qi.com or tweeting at no such thing. That's right. And if you would like to go to no such thing as a fish.com, there's all sorts of extra stuff there, including a portal to Club Fish, the exclusive members lounge where you can kick back, enjoy some bonus content, some ad free shows, all for a very reasonable price. And if you do it via Apple Podcasts, you can get a free month trial membership of Clubfish, which we also recommend very highly. Okay, that's it. We'll be back again next week with another one of these. We'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>